Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is the bearable bull here. And I got this aggressively average content for you today. As guys, the number one chart that I've had my eyes glued on has been the DXY. And ladies and gentlemen, the DXY is the chart that I have stated to every single one of you that if I paid stronger attention to in 2022, I would not have made one of the bigger crypto mistakes in my career. I believed in 2022 we were heading into an old coin season for a number of reasons. But had I just paid attention to the DXY, I would have known that was not going to happen. And here we are at a critical point that I'm paying extremely close attention to. We're looking at a critical resistance level for the DXY. And if we break it, crypto may not be ready to appreciate just yet. And that's the 102.9 level on the DXY. And it's something I want to tell every single one of you to pay attention to. Because if we pass it, we may be in for some trouble in the crypto market. I've been in discussions with a number of different analysts behind the scenes recently. And this is one of those moments where I could honestly say the market could go either way. Bitcoin is not appreciated yet. And alts have been wavering. We need to see something drastic changing with the market right now if we're going to see price action in the short term. And this is one of those moments where in the next couple days we're about to find out what the next couple weeks are going to look like. But ladies and gentlemen, that being said, this does not change anything with regards to XRP. As XRP will be ready in the next couple months into 2024 for what I believe will be a push to new all-time highs. It's a beautiful time to be alive if you're an XRP holder, and it's something that should give all of you extreme confidence. Now, from ISO 20022, let's go. The man speaking in this video is from Finastra. And he stated that instant payments is not coming in 2028, but instead coming in 2023 or 2024. I'm a big believer that the rollout of the new digital payment system is accelerating at real time as we speak. And you better be in before it's too late. Because once it goes, it's not going to stop. Sometimes it takes a long time for technology to be adopted. But once it finally does get adopted, it happens all at once. Excuse me, the key times, because we're not far away, right? You know, this is not like, you know, at the end of the century. This is pretty soon, right? Yeah, and I think also, uh, this is also, I will reflect, I will uh, relate to uh, the J20 things, right? The, what they announced, because if you look, if you look at the, so key timing. Okay, so key timing, I don't know what you have in mind exactly, but I will maybe differentiate two things. The timing that, the, uh, that is uh, decided by the market, by the market, I mean regulators, kind of, and, be, and the timing for banks, because uh, maybe we don't, we don't live in the same uh, space and time, right? But we, they will have to connect or synchronize for sure. So what we see, there are different uh, initiatives, or there have been initiatives in the world, which are arriving soon, being live soon, like Fenno uh, in the US. We see uh, um, uh, the instant payment, which already exists in Europe, but will be, will be make mandatory. And we think that the law might be enforced by the end of this year, meaning banks will have six months to receive and six months to send after that. So it's almost tomorrow, right? Uh, we see also NPA in the UK. So we see the market and SIG5 in Switzerland. So all of this, and it's not, we are not talking about something arriving in 2028. It's 2023, 2024 at the latest. So if I may, I would say it's almost tomorrow, right? It's almost tomorrow. So better be ready. So this is the key timeline from the market. No, if you consider financial institutions, when you have to comply and be ready for, let's say, 18 months, if we consider European uh, to receive, uh, you better not start in 12 months, right? It will be too late. So, and also because of what we saw with the, G, um, the G20, um, the G20, there are a lot of these things. So it's almost tomorrow, almost tomorrow. So some banks, and we, because as a vendor, we talk with a lot of banks also. Some banks are ready, some banks are aware. Ladies and gentlemen, it's almost happening tomorrow. That's one of my favorite quotes I've ever heard. 
Something every single one of you needs to understand is that with the freedom XRP now has in the open market, with the relisting on these exchanges, we are going to get to see XRP actually work on the open market without restrictions. XRP's 2021 bull run price appreciation was hyper suppressed, but this time around, I expect much better things to come. And a crypto whose price action recently has not been suppressed is XDC, as XDC has major events happening for its ecosystem over the next couple weeks. A few months back, Doug Brooks, senior advisor at Sinfin, openly stated that XDC is a sleeping giant. And I think we're beginning to see the initial stages of that sleeping giant status. I want all of you to take a listen, as I know plenty of you guys are big XDC holders in the XRP community. I guess the way I want to start this is, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding in the crypto space, more where me and Dave come from, where crypto Twitter, right? And the, the crypto Twitter mm -hmm. sphere where people think that, oh, if, if you're not going to get CBDCs, there's nothing. Or if you don't get all the payments, there's nothing. But they don't, yeah. there's so much more than just CBDCs. After the yeah. CBDC, there's potential for so many other ways that blockchain, crypto, whatever people want to call it, Absolutely. to be used, right? So just because there's not CBDCs involved necessarily it doesn't mean that there's not a lot of room for growth and potential for market share or whatever you want to say for blockchain, mm -hmm. XTC network or whatever blockchain it is that you want to talk about. Uh, absolutely. Good indicators for what you've just said are the size of the trade finance opportunity for blockchain, which is a couple of trillion dollars. That's, that's an enormous <laughs> opportunity. And on top of that, Citibank published a report very recently in which a couple of XDC personalities made very nice contributions. The key stat in all of that is uh, their estimation of the size of the tokenization market, which they say will soon be worth $4 trillion. So the potential for, for blockchain and for tokenization as one element of that is enormous it's it's so big already and we are looking at exponential growth over the next two or three years and if we position ourselves correctly with the right partners and we integrate the right platforms most suitable platforms onto xdc then um, we really are a sleeping giant that is in the process of waking up right now now ladies and gentlemen with that being said we understand that payments, instant payments, are not going to take five years. They're going to happen very quickly. We understand that XDC is a sleeping giant. We understand that the global elites are preparing for something big as we speak. And here we just saw recently that the Bank of England has adopted Ripple's interledger protocol for payment settlements. The Bank of England has released a paper exploring Ripple's integrations for payment settlements, and the paper reveals successful integrations of Ripple solutions with two simulated real-time growth settlement systems. But these are things that we've always known were in the works, as the Bank of England has been a long-time Ripple partner. It's been a long time since they've done proof of concepts. And the big things every single one of you need to understand is with Fed now going live in the States with a digital pound looking to go live in the UK with a digital euro looking to go live in Europe with CBDCs in Palau, Bhutan, Colombia, Montenegro and Hong Kong being built on XRP with 15% of central banks being confirmed as being about to build on XRP CBDC platform. We know how massive what's about to happen is. And I can't stress to every single one of you how important it is that you don't get fudded out by any of the crypto volatility or narratives. Something that has been understated and will continue to be understated is how important the XRP win was against the SEC. And here, Thinking Crypto said it best. Jay Clayton made an appearance on CNBC 
And CNBC failed to do their jobs and asked about the SEC Ripple ruling, as Jay Clayton was the one who filed the lawsuit against Ripple and then ran out the door the next day. Ladies and gentlemen, Jay Clayton was the reason XRP did not participate in the 2021 bull run due to this SEC case. And yet here he stands with ETH conflicts of interest, with no accountability, talking on mainstream television as if he gives a damn. So here's what I'm going to say. He talks about a couple important things that I actually do think all of you should be aware of. And I want you all to listen to what he has to say, as it's going to lead to great context over the next couple weeks of what we're going to discuss. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the bearable bull here. Thanks for tuning in. As always, I appreciate every single one of you. Now I'll be back tomorrow with another video. Welcome back to Squawk Box. We have so much to talk to Jay Clayton about, who is here. We're going to talk about BlackRock, crypto, Fitch, downgrades, everything. Uh, but here's where, we're, here's where we're going to start the conversation, because BlackRock is under some fire uh, in Capitol Hill. Uh, the House Select Committee on China now reportedly launching a probe into the world's largest asset manager. Lawmakers alleging the BlackRock is facilitating investment in Chinese companies accused of bolstering China's military and violating human rights. For more, I want to talk to Jay Clayton, who's here. Uh, at the table, of course, uh, at Apollo, non-executive chair and a CNBC contributor. Good morning. Morning. Okay, so what do you make of this? You've been you've been somewhat uh, somewhat. You've been a China hawk. Is that fair to say? That that is. Let's let's yes. Let's just go with yes. Just go with yes. Okay. So, what do you think is really happening here? Well, this committee, it's a bipartisan committee, which is rare right now. We'll come we'll come back to what you know partisanship has meant for our debt rating, but it's a bipartisan committee. It's not a legislative committee. It's a committee designed to bring out information. And this is one step in bringing out information. Let me, let me take this to just a, a little bit higher level. Yep. We're, we're into the presidential cycle, okay? What are the big issues for um, you know, kitchen table Americas in, in, in this cycle? We've got abortion, okay, put that to the side. We've got the border, put that to the side, maybe. Three big ones that all relate to China. Climate, you're not gonna solve climate without dealing with China. We can now all accept that. Mm -hmm. The economy, the strength of the dollar, and national security. Those three, those three big ones, all depend on our relationship with China. We've talked before about conjoined twins in our economy with China. You know, China's economy doesn't look so good right now. I think one of the headwinds for the U.S. economy is where the China, China's okay, so, economy is. What, what, what are you arguing should happen here? Because well, you've, been, you've been hawkish, as I, as I said, about China, about the national security issues, about some of the companies and how to deal with them. If we, if we have to act, if we are twins, conjoined twins, mm -hmm. what's that relationship supposed to look like? Well, it's that you can't deal with those things in isolation. You can't deal with national security in isolation from the economy and, you know, climate being a political issue in isolation from. All of the candidates need to be able to deal with those issues in an open forum. This committee, and let's go back to your question right. about MSCI and, and BlackRock, what they're saying is, okay, when I invest in an index, when I invest in a global index, how much of my money is going into the Chinese public capital markets? And where is, what is that money going to finance? That's a very good question when those three big issues for Americans all depend on our relationship with China, which is, which what, is not a good one. But then what's the answer? What's the answer? What, we, we just had uh, the regulator on about uh, commodities, and, and specifically we're talking about crypto. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, do you regulate it? Do you not regulate it? How do you regulate it? How do you regulate something that's in another place? Okay, for, for, first thing toward, toward regulation is transparency, right? One of the things that I saw right. Russ, and Russ was saying, what's my biggest frustration with crypto is that I'm not getting transparency onshore and offshore in the, in the gray areas. Right. Transparency on our dealings with China. You can't solve these problems until you understand them. And what's, what's my view? We are too dependent. I think everybody agrees with that. We can't have a sharp decoupling, but we, and our economic strength. That's, okay, we can't have a sharp decoupling. That's because that's the point I come back to all the time. Mm -hmm. How do you do it gradually? How do you do it softly? And if they're, I mean, like, what's the definition of a sharp decoupling? Because I, I do worry about global security 
if there is no connection mm -hmm. between the two countries. Because I, I think the Chinese have done a lot of pretty shady and awful things along the way. You watch Oppenheimer and you think, wow, there's a problem with us having no connection to another superpower mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. on the globe. Look, we have, we have, we have I'll, I'll, I'll give Henry Kissinger credit for this. We have, we have something that has never ended well in the past. We have a superpower, the United States, and a rising power. When you have a superpower and a rising power, generally that ends in conflict. Are we going to, to use the phrase we use right. too much, are we going to be able to land the plane of a rising power and a superpower? Right, but then we had Nikki Haley sit, uh, sit at this desk a week ago, and you would have thought that she was prepared to declare war on China. I mean, I, I say this because you know, there's a lot of people who are in Washington today who, I'm, I, you know, they, they are all for the decoupling. Okay, what, what are our assets? What, start with what our assets are to solve this. Economic strength. Okay, we should be focusing on economic strength. We have better relative economic strength right now. One of, one of the issues is, how are we doing going forward? Okay, we, have, we do have rising right. debt and deficit. Well, That's in the, what do you make the, of the rhetoric? I'm just curious about the rhetoric piece of this, because, we, because it, it almost feels like it's the U.S. Simple. even more than in China the right now. The rhetoric is too simple. It's too simple. It's too simple. Okay, you know the the this or that. Right. That's that's too simple. We we need we need to continue right. our military strength. We need to continue our economic strength, and we need to diversify. Right. Um, talking about.